Liberty lovers, and welcome to the Liberty Mike podcast, broadcasting from an undisclosed location in the heart of Dixie. I am Michael, and I am here with Liberty Larry. How's it going? I'm doing okay. For those of you that don't know how I manage to time this right every week so that it aligns with the music, it's because I can watch Liberty Larry like <laughs> mouthing it Bob to along. <laughs> Bob it along to the music yeah, the that's not playing. <laughs> oh, I know the listeners hear it, and I hear it too. In my head. <laughs> Just rattling around in there. Yeah. Wow. Oh, well, um, yeah, doing okay. Oh, good. It's yeah. It didn't get as cold this week as it was supposed to. I was really looking forward to, to like, you know, low 50s. Yeah. And stuff this week, and that's not happening. No, don't look that way. Oh, well. Uh, it was our last chance, you know. <laughs> well, yeah, I was going to say, like, Easter is really kind of like the cutoff for cold weather. We mm. usually have a nice cold snap over Easter, and that's usually it. Yeah. Well, I, I really could have used a, another one before it's just, like, hot for a long time. Yeah, right. Oh, it's coming. It's coming. Yeah. Gotta love the South. I, yeah. You don't have to love the <coughs> South. I do love the South. <laughs> but... I think it, I think I love the South because I spend a lot of time indoors. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> especially during the in summer. In the summer, oh yeah. yeah. Um, so, uh, well, here we go. Just go yeah. ahead. You never get used to it, you know. Ninety-eight degrees and one hundred percent humidity for like months at a time. Yeah, you, j- you can never get used to that. Yeah, uh, you can't I, take <laughs> off enough clothes. <laughs> right, like you could be naked. It's still not enough clothes taken off. <laughs> then you're just naked and sweaty. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> precisely. Yeah. Uh, well. Yeah. Oh well. I love it down here anyway. I do too. I am. I am. I'm ready to move. Though. Yeah. Um, I'm ready for something. <laughs> somewhere, different. somewhere cooler. Well, certainly somewhere cooler. If I'm moving, I'm definitely moving somewhere cooler or yeah. somewhere with more seasonal variation. Maybe. Oh yeah. Is a better way or longer seasons besides summer. Yeah. All right. Uh, I don't know. I um, I've I've looked at some places in the Midwest. Yeah, That'd and I haven't lived in that part of the country. That could be fun. I think so. A lot of a lot of open spaces and a lot of whiskey. I'll come visit. Okay, that's nice of you. <laughs> I'll be closer to my my brother also. Yeah, yeah. Because we're a long ways away from that here. Yeah. That's okay. I um. Red, he, he had a, a put up a Substack this week, or yeah, I think it was this week. Um, must have been this week, middle of the week. And he was talking about how he, you know he's preparing for the hundred mile race sometime over the next couple of years, oh, which yeah. is yeah, completely insane. And um, but he did some fifty k's this winter, yeah, and uh, and he's got a hundred k coming up. Ooh. And so he was saying, you know, now I'm, I got to get ready to start training seriously. And he's like, so, uh, joined a gym, got on a meal plan, got a running trainer, joined a running group, like all, oh, wow. all these things like, that he did. Yeah. And, uh, it was something like, well, you know, these things could make a big difference in my life and, and meet some new people and make me more patient with other things and just like better adapt me to all kinds of stuff. Although conventional wisdom says that you should make behavioral changes like one thing at a time. Um, but I've I've never been good at moderation. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> it's either all in or nothing at all. All or nothing. That's him for sure, too. Yeah. He's it always been that way. Made me laugh. I read it to a guy at my office that was the same, that's the same way. Yeah. And as soon as I finished reading it to him, he was like, oh, man, that's totally me. And I was like, yeah, I know. That's why I thought you'd like it. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. Um, So what do we want to talk about? I don't know. Uh, let's do a little one to start and then we'll move into a bigger topic to just kind of take us all the way through the rest all right. of the time. I'm done. Um, so the, there was a, a UN security council resolution that passed, um, calling for a, actually demanding, it's very specific in the revolution, yeah. demanding a ceasefire in Gaza, um, demanding the release of all hostages on both sides. Yeah. Um, and, uh, demanding unrestricted aid 
humanitarian aid. And we didn't block it? We were, it was 14 to zero. Yeah. With the U.S. abstaining. The U.S. is the only abstention. (laughs) Yeah. So. And that's where the, so the uh, abstention for us was the big controversy that I heard. Yeah. Because the Israelis did not appreciate that. Yeah. Obviously we should have blocked it. Yeah. But the And we had the power to, right? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, we're one of the permanent members on the Security Council. We can veto anything that we want. Yeah, so we could, we, yeah, we could have done it. Absolutely. Um, why didn't we? It's an election year, and this is a touchy subject here in the U.S. right now. I think that that's exactly right. Um, yeah. That the <coughs> Democrat Party particularly is very divided on the Israel-Palestine issue. Yep. And the Biden administration cannot continue to support Israel and their at least ethnic cleansing in Gaza um, and watch these all these bodies pile up without it, without being concerned even though they're already they already looks like Biden's behind in all the polls to Trump it, it already looks like Trump's going to win this election which oh, yeah. geez. which is which is insane for it to look that way this early in i mean it that's wild to me mm-hmm. um Especially when you consider 2016 when he actually did win and like the conventional wisdom was there was no way um, for it to be looking the way it looks right now. Like say we're a long ways away. Well, so there's a lot of. Lot there's of, still plenty of shenanigans left. In there's that. plenty of time, <laughs> like I say, but but it is strange. Yeah. Uh, well, he's. He, Biden's got a loser on a lot of big topics right now. Oh, dude, it's it's an, the the we're, the position that the Biden administration has put itself in is insane. Mm-hmm. To me. Um, the Israel Palestine thing is an extremely divisive issue among his base. The border, the immigration issue, he's gone all in with, and it's clearly a problem. Yeah. Um, and no matter how much they talk about Bidenomics and how great the economy is, people yeah. are out there buying stuff. Yeah, yeah. And trying to live. Well, yeah, uh, yeah. Yeah, they can't. I mean, you can't just go around telling everybody the economy is great. The economy is great. The economy is what it is. Like the economy is what people feel. Yeah. Like, and that's an individual thing. So I'm I'm sure there's probably a subset of people there that are like, oh, this economy really is good. I am Mm -hmm. doing good. Mm -hmm. But there ain't a lot of those. (laughs) Yeah. That's not a majority of people, I promise. Yeah, that's the I talk to a lot of people. (laughs) The the people that feel that way are the executives at Raytheon and Northrop Grumman. Yeah, (laughs) exactly. Lockheed Martin. Exactly. That's that's who feels really good about this economy. Yeah. Uh, Well, more on that later. All right. Um, So... The uh, one of the interesting things is that the, none of these requirements, require, demands are dependent on any other demand. They're they're separate. Okay. It's, so it's not like a ceasefire as long as the hostages r- are released or something like that. It is yeah. a ceasefire and <coughs> hostages released. Yeah. And humanitarian aid. Um, so on the with a deal like that, like what's the enforcement mechanism? Unfortunately, the enforcement mechanism is probably the U.S. military, which won't do anything about it. Yeah. Um, the U.S. has made it very clear that they're not going to do anything to enforce this yeah. resolution. And we abstain, so we're not really... Yeah. It's not like we took a side, uh, technically. So, so everything will continue probably as it has, although it's just it's really bad PR for Israel. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but Israel doesn't seem to care about their PR. No, they they have a real arrogance about them that's something, I don't know, it's scary to me the arrogance Mm -hmm. that they seem to have as far as just not caring what the rest of the world thinks while they do what they're going to do. And not only the rest of the world, but I mean, we are their biggest ally. And I mean, they'll they'll throw the finger to us too. Yeah. Yeah. and yeah, they get no problems with that. Yeah, they, they have no problems. Of course, with we that we at do all. too. Remember, we're like we're yeah. a bunch of uh, higher ups in the federal government. We're just recently calling for a regime change in Israel. Well, so. that's true. I mean, <laughs> there's something to that. So, I mean, I yeah. guess there is a little tit for tat there. But no loyalty yeah. among thieves or whatever. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, um, I don't know. Israel. It, it's it's a strange thing to me the, the way the way they operate. I don't know. Mm-hmm. 
Um, so I don't know. We'll see if anything comes to this. It would be nice. Yeah. I, I just don't see, I don't see anybody being able to force it to happen. And I don't see Israel choosing to follow. Oh, there's no way they'll choose to. So, I, I mean, I don't see that. Um, thing, um, things will have to change a lot for them to make some decisions. Like, it'll take more than this, I'll say that. Yeah. Boycott, divest. Yeah. I'm not really on board with the sanction part, but... Yeah. <laughs> boycott, divest. Like, yeah. it, it has strong impact. Yeah. It, like, that works, actually. Yeah. Um, it's worked over and over again in the past... It's probably the best path to try and force Israel into doing, to try and put enough pressure on Israel to change their behavior. It's probably the best path. Yeah. yeah. Best nonviolent path. Yeah. Um, we'll see. I mean, there's a whole lot coming out right now about this, uh, you know, a starvation campaign in Rafa and so on. So, I don't know. It's looking bad for them. But yeah. like I said, they don't seem to care. And I, I don't know what the, <laughs> what kind of pressure it will take to make them change their behavior. Yeah. And I think that the only way to do it is money. Yeah. Yeah. So, because U.S. and this is one place the U.S. won't invade. Yeah, right. Well, that ain't happening. Yeah. Um. So, I there was a, something happened in Baltimore. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that has gotten a lot of press. Yeah. Something about the bridge, maybe? Yeah, some, yeah. Somebody ran into a bridge. Yeah, yeah. And it fell down. Yeah. Uh, this is a real problem for Baltimore. Um, it, it it completely restricts access to their harbor for anything large. Yeah. For who knows how long. Yeah, it's going to be a while from what mm -hmm. I understand. Yeah. Um, um, and now it's I bad keep, for their traffic, too. <laughs> yeah, I, and I keep thinking, though, well, they have another bridge across the... Yeah, but uh, I mean, like I say, I mean, yeah, and that's that's something, but it's still like you're talking about bottleneck now. Yeah. Um, now I keep thinking that they they've already got a whole lot of that steel resting on top of the ship that hit it. Yeah. It seems like they make it, that should simplify things as far as removing debris. <laughs> right. Uh, but uh, certainly, some things have collapsed into the water as well, and they made more of an issue, like so. There's been a lot of conspiracy silliness about yeah, this. And it does seem to be silliness. Uh, it, it seems like, <laughs> from what I can tell, from what I've read and so forth, it, it doesn't... This is actually a more common thing than people realize. Kind of like train derailments, I suppose. Yeah. Um, usually it's tugboats that accidentally push these kind of things into bridges and so forth. Yeah. Um, this was... Uh, kind of under its own power. I mean, it, it wasn't being guided anyway. Yeah. Uh, the problem seems to be a loss of power, so it wasn't exactly under its own power. I, I heard a lot of people say, "Well, you know, why didn't they, why didn't they turn or stop well, or whatever?" Like they did try to drop anchor. Oh yeah, yeah. So yeah. that's a, you know, a a big piece of data in favor of that. This is just a something that went terribly this wrong. This is just an accident. Yeah. yeah. Um. Those ships are big. They've got a lot of oh, yeah. momentum. It does not stop easily. It's not like hitting the brakes in your car. Yeah, right. Uh, so. it, it's more like trying to redirect a spacecraft. Yeah, right. <laughs> but um, it, it seems like they just had power issues and then um, additional power issues. And, and it's just... It makes things me, just went wrong. The thing that's crazy to me is like you watch it happen, and I expected like when it hit that that part of the bridge was going to go down, mm -hmm. but so much of that bridge went down when it hit that yeah. that thing. Like that's what really blew my mind. And I mean, apparently that's just the way bridges are built. Like they're just suspension they're, bridges generally. Like yeah, it doesn't take a lot of failures for the whole thing to go. To go. Which is which is what we witnessed with that. Um, but that just shocked me that that compromising that one little piece would cause so much damage. Like I expected, like the the pieces directly in relation to it to go, mm -hmm. but like not what happened. Yeah, well, there's a lot of uh, of balancing of force. Yeah, in those kind of things. So. If one side goes out, then it's off balance. It's like uh, you've probably seen the funny, funny videos. Yeah. Um, 
my brother watches the uh fail army oh yeah, yeah, yeah. kind of yeah. things yeah. on oh, youtube yeah. or whatever nah, i've watched some of that too and <laughs> yeah. one thing that it tells me is that like we're just really terrible <laughs> yeah. people generally because the first thing that happens when something awful happens to somebody else is everybody around laughs, laughs yeah but yeah. You've seen a lot of the uh, people with weights that apparently don't realize that there are clips to hold the weights in place, and yeah. weights will come off of one side. Oh yeah, and then yeah. they collapse. They, then it, yeah, that's kind of how the bridge works. Too. Okay, yeah, same idea. Yeah. yeah, um, the the load is balanced across, yeah. and so if you lose one side, then yeah. all of the load falls onto the other side, and it's just not it's enough. It's just going to topple. Yeah. yeah. Um, but uh. You know, there's some other stuff that came out later in terms of they they did contact the bridge, so that's why there wasn't a lot more casualties. Yeah, because um, the people that were it. lost were people that were working on the bridge. They weren't yeah commuters or whatever you'd yeah. say. Well, I think there were a few commuters, but the people that were basically on the bridge before they could block it off, like it could have been a lot worse, was my understanding. Oh yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Um, what I read the other day is that that all of the casualties were this group of people that were fixing they were potholes. fixing potholes yeah yeah so um, um anyway that's lucky yeah right. i mean not for them obviously no, but, but yeah i mean the it, whole, it, on the whole it could have been a lot worse and yeah. like i say i mean this could have happened during rush hour traffic too yeah. you know like yeah. that could have really been and not the middle of the night you know um well it doesn't directly relate i thought that this would be a good opportunity though, to talk about some economics. All right. Because we were talking the other night about um, how do you make the argument to somebody whose paycheck is dependent on government subsidies, essentially. So we're talking about military contractors specifically. Yeah. Um, that, that we'd all be better off including them if they weren't drawing that paycheck. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, which is, it's a hard argument to make, but yeah. it's a hard argument to make to somebody that's collecting that paycheck and that's their livelihood. <laughs> yeah. It's the Upton Sinclair thing about, um, it's, it's hard to make somebody understand, uh, something when his paycheck is dependent on his ignorance. Yeah. Yeah. Um, there's definitely something that's to not that. the quote exactly, but it's a decent paraphrase. No, absolutely. Um, but I, I thought we, you know, we could talk about the infrastructure issues, in this country because there are infrastructure oh, issues oh, in this for country. Real. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, so, but let's, let's start with that question about the contractors, about the, the people that, that work for businesses whose revenue is drawn primarily from the U S government. Yeah. Um, so first off, in a sense, that person is partly paying their own salary. Yeah. Through. I mean, that goes for anybody that works for the government, though. Well, yeah, absolutely. I mean, yeah. I, I've always said that government people that are working for the government, they shouldn't even pay taxes. They should just have their salary reduced by the amount that they would <laughs> but usually that they pay would in pay. taxes. Because yeah. um, it's just moving water from one bucket to another without changing the total volume. Exactly. Although the total volume does actually change. Like, you know, if you think about it in terms of if you you cup get a cup full of hand, you know, your hand. All right. I don't know how to say that. Um, <laughs> you cup of you cup, cup your hands, yeah, right, and and move some water from one bucket to another. You actually lose some water in between because your your hands aren't a perfect yeah. seal. And to me, that's just that represents what's lost is represents the bureaucrats that are paid to manage that money <laughs> <All> <laughs> moving right. back and forth. You yeah, know, yeah. Um, so in truth. The you don't uh, you're just moving water from one bucket to another, but you're losing some <laughs> along the way. Right? Yeah. Um, but uh, anyway, <laughs> so the other thing is that that person's wife probably works. Yeah. In this day and age, um, unless she's working for the military contractor too, which could happen. Which could happen, but we'll assume it doesn't in this okay. case because it's easier. All right. Uh then she's paying for her husband's salary too. Yeah. Oh, that's true. <laughs> and all of their friends that yeah. aren't work friends yeah. from the military contractor, yeah. they're all paying that guy's salary too. Oh, yeah. 
And, the, and what, what's so crazy about that is um, when you get into the political aspect of that, like talking about like Northrop Grumman here or any of these places that have these um, contracts. This drink is really too good. It disappears too fast, doesn't it? I tell you, man, I'm, all, I'm like savoring mine. <laughs> but yeah, all of those friends you're talking about that don't work for, for that company, mm-hmm. like they're going to be pissed. And that's a voting block in itself of the not the people who actually work there, but who know somebody that works there and don't want to see them lose their job. Yeah. Like, I mean, that, that's the reason this works so well as far as like a control type mechanism, like that's the reason it's so hard to get rid of these things once you have them in place Mm -hmm. is because so many people are like so tied up in it and don't understand that it's just robbing the system. Right. Well, and that's the, that's the important point is that all government spending reduces the resources that are available for the production of consumables. Yeah. Yeah for the production of all the things that we use. Yeah. And especially when we're talking about military contractors, you're talking about <laughs> resources being used to produce a product that isn't consumed in the United States and that in a lot of cases is literally shipped halfway around the world to blow it up. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like uh, like we're producing this to destroy something. Yeah, and across so the world. All those resources are just shipped out of the United States and for not any productive cause. Yeah. Um so what that does though is that since those resources aren't freed up for production of consumables here in the US, it reduces the number of consumables here in the US that are produced. Yeah. Well, if you reduce the supply of something, yeah. price goes up. Yep. Um, so this increase in prices affects everything else that that person, whose paycheck is also drawn from taxpayer money, everything that they buy, everything yeah. that they, you know, every time their spouse goes to the grocery store, prices are up because of his salary yeah. or that person's salary. Yeah. Um, Everything that you, all the school supplies for the kids, yeah, they cost more because of that person's salary. And I, I'm, I'm personalizing it in a lot of ways. Yeah, you know, it's obviously it's but spread it's out because of the money but, that goes towards those type of things mm-hmm. is what you're getting at. Exactly. Um, so, and at this point, it, it's just all government spending is money that's drawn away from the economy to go into productive things. And mm-hmm. at this point, uh. Something like, well, more than 40% of the U.S. gross domestic product is government spending. Yeah. And, of course, government can't spend any money that it hasn't first stolen from you in one way or another. Yeah. Um, which is which is the key point that I feel like people, especially when it comes to, like, these military contracts and stuff, the thing that people forget is that like, that's our money. Like, mm-hmm. the government doesn't just have these resources to disperse out because so oftentimes people think that are, there's just this idea out there where the government's got the money. They just need to, you know, spend it here or spend it there. Mm-hmm. And that's, that's our money. Like that's the only reason they have everything they have is stolen. Yes. <laughs> it, yeah. Um, in one way or another. Yeah. And, uh, and we'll talk more about creating money out of nothing a little later in this. Yeah. Um, borrowing has, the same effect essentially all, it's all um, the same yeah uh government doesn't produce anything yeah everything that it uses it has to first take from somebody else yeah and, and this is this is a, a point that i know like we hammer on here because i think that there's gen, there's a general misunderstanding about that there um, is that government has some kind of assets of its own which I guess at this point it does have some assets of its own, but it has assets of its own because it stole from it. it like it's yeah. it's stolen because, because ever, since its inception, it's been taking from people. <laughs> right. Um, and the idea that more than forty percent of uh, gross domestic domestic product is government spending is just a, a sign of how poor the economy is. Well, it's a recipe for disaster too. Absolutely. So this infrastructure issue. Yeah. Um. When you start talking about uh, resources being drawn out of the productive economy, that's resources that could be used on infrastructure. Yeah. Now, I'm not on board with government spending on infrastructure particularly. And in fact, I was reading last night, this is, I found this to be really fascinating, um, that 
by the time of the Civil War, there were only two states out of the 20 whatever that existed at the time yeah. um, that allowed their uh, allowed government spending on infrastructure. Really? Yes. Uh, because a Lex. lot of states had spent government money on infrastructure, uh, mostly railroad yeah. uh, things, um, but also ro- uh, you know, highways and, and thoroughfares of various kinds, but mostly railroads. Yeah. And they'd all been in the early 19th century. They'd yeah. all been a complete disaster. Yeah. The corruption is rampant. I was going to say the corruption's got to be a problem. Um, decisions were made on political, uh, with political reasoning instead of economic reasoning. So then, um, if you had a railroad that was passing through, uh, uh, an area, it had to touch like some corner of every person's property, you know, to make them happy instead of just being a straight line and conserving resources. Right. Um, because the government doesn't have to worry about loss. Yeah. Uh, the, uh, uh, a capitalist has to worry about profit and loss. Yeah. And loss is a problem. And yeah. so you can serve resources as much as possible. Government doesn't make decisions based on the same thing. Mm-mm. Government makes decisions based on how they can get enough votes to get their way. Yeah. And so it becomes uh, a, a complete waste in a lot of ways. And so these governments had spent lots and lots of money on these various infrastructure projects, and most of them didn't even get completed. Yeah, really? Yeah. Um, so... <laughs> Most of the states uh, in the Union at the time um, ended up adopting amendments to their own state constitutions uh, forbidding use of government money towards infrastructure projects. That's crazy. Um, But then Lincoln came in. Yeah. Lincoln was a big believer in infrastructure projects. Yeah. Even though Illinois was a complete disaster on state infrastructure (laughs) issues. But anyway... um, so I'm, I'm not on board on, on state or government management of infrastructure. And here's another reason why, is that even the, the pieces of our infrastructure that are privately owned, there's no incentive for uh, those private companies to improve them or maintain them in any way. Because our government keeps talking about all this money that they're going to take from the taxpayer to give towards infrastructure projects and rebuilding infrastructure and maintaining infrastructure and updating infrastructure. So if you're a private owner of a bridge or a dam or a whatever, yeah. why would you spend your own money yeah. on improving these things? Because right. all you, if you, you wait are, you long almost, enough... You almost want them to deteriorate exactly. to give you a good ploy to go to the government. Hey, like it's really bad. We need it fixed. Right. You're absolutely right. It creates an incentive actually to let it fall apart. Yeah. Because then you're more likely to get that government money Yep. To fix it. Absolutely. So, um, with that being said, mm -hmm. it would be a better use of resources to use that Northrop Grumman money to fix a bridge than it would be to send it across the world and blow it up. Like I'm not for, I'm, I'm with you. Like I Mm -hmm. think privatization is the way, but given the current state of things. Yeah. Well, that would be a move in the right direction, certainly. But the, the better use of it would be to let all the taxpayers just keep that people. money. Yeah, return it to the people. And spend it on what they want to. Yeah. The The idea that we need government to build roads and so <laughs> forth is ridiculous. Um, yeah. Roads were being built long before government was doing it. And they were being and they were built doing more a lot efficiently. better job. Yeah. Exactly. Um, because businesses are interested in people being able to get to their business. Yeah. yeah. So there were, in, in fact... Um, Again, in the early 19th century, there were a a whole lot, like it was a booming business, private enterprises building roads because they were getting private contracts all over the country to connect towns and cities and markets to various other parts of the state and county and so forth. Yeah. Um, Because it was was an improvement that everybody benefited from. So you didn't need government to direct that at all. Yeah. People yeah. were perfectly happy to pit, spend their own money to be able to access a market easier. Absolutely. And and businesses were very happy to spend their own money to make it easier for people to access their market. Absolutely. I mean, it just makes sense. Yes. 
Um, so the infrastructure issue that I just described, though, in terms of you're actually incentivized not to do anything is the same kind of bailout issue that we've had with the banks now. Yeah. Um, this is hopefully something that people can more easily wrap their heads around because... Because 2008 happened. Yeah, and 2001 <laughs> happened, too. Oh, well, yeah. Um, and so, uh, you know, the banks... There's no incentive for the banks to make smart investments. Yeah. And in fact, they're incentivized to make riskier and riskier investments because what they've been shown is that if they fail, the government will bail them out. And if they succeed, they get to divide up the money amongst themselves. Yeah, exactly. So they can they can privatize um, profits and subsidize losses. Yeah. That's a, it's an amazing system. Yes. Yeah. It um, works out for some people. Well, and a lot of that comes out of uh, the uh, Federal Reserve. Yeah. All right. So uh, I, I found it interesting. This is also in my reading last night. Um, I was really, uh, reading, um, is it Thomas? I think it's Thomas DiLorenzo's uh, How Capitalism Saved America. Oh, okay. So this is a, I've been enjoying this book. This is a worthwhile read. Um, if I had a reading list on our website, like I had planned to do originally, it would be there. <laughs> All right. Um, but anyway, uh, <laughs> he, he was quoting this Virginia Senator from the early days of the Republic. Yeah. Um, so we're actually talking, I think we're talking about late 18th century here. It might've been early 19th century at this time, but I didn't write down a date. Yeah. But anyway, he said, um, the formation of a central bank because this was a big debate in the country at the time. Yeah. Um, the formation of a central bank would lead to, quote, economic gangrene. Yeah. <laughs> and I thought, what an incredible description, especially then, because yeah. gangrene was a death sentence I was going to say, that was a problem then, right? Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, so, I mean, the only, the only thing that you could do about gangrene at that time, really, was to cut off the limb. I was going to say, lose whatever's got it in it, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, I hope it's not on your torso. So, I mean, that's no longer true. <laughs> but at the time, yeah, the only way to deal with gangrene was to just cut off the limb. Yeah. And and hope that you didn't die from that infection. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, so I anyway, I, I thought that was a really good description of the Fed. And I, I was thinking about it and I was like, okay, so we've had the Federal Reserve now. This is, The Federal Reserve was the, the third iteration of a central bank in this country. Okay. Um. But the, and this is why we praise Andrew Jackson for at least one thing that he did, which was to veto um, the central bank's free charter okay. that existed at, during his administration, yeah. which was, the, I believe, the first central bank at that time. But anyway, um, so the Federal Reserve has now had more than 100 years to do what they said that they were formed to do, which is to stabilize prices and ensure full employment. Yeah. And in a hundred and they were formed in nineteen thirteen, right? So yep. in a, a hundred and ten years, yeah. they have never succeeded in this. <laughs> right. <laughs> never, not once. Yeah. They have never succeeded in ensuring full employment or stabilizing prices. Um, and in fact, uh since the formation of the central bank, the inflation of the US dollar has been over a thousand percent. That's wild. So what cost you $10 in 1912 will cost you $100 today for the exact same thing. <laughs> yeah. It's insane. Um, Which is the reason gold's such a good investment is because gold is like a... a, a it's real money. It's re Yeah, it's, it's... Yeah, exactly. That's the best way to put it, yeah. <laughs> it, it has yeah. A, a real intrinsic tradable value. Yeah. Um. The value is a little bit too high, which is why, I, like, mm -hmm. we talk about a gold economy, but really, gold economies were silver economies. Yeah. <laughs> because everyday purchases, like, gold's not really that useful for. Yeah. Dude, I love silver. Like I say, I buy I buy some every month. Yeah, I, I did a for a believer. long time when it was, like, 16 yeah. to $18 a, an it's, ounce. Is it 25 as of when we record this podcast? I checked yeah. it this morning. <laughs> yeah, so I've, I've made a I've made a good return on what I bought back then. Yeah. Um, but I haven't bought it in a while. Yeah, I'm a big believer in that. Like I said, I buy it frequently. Yeah, I've made a decent return on my gold purchases too. Yeah. Um, 
Not stuff, as good. Like, stuff like that just holds its value, or I say it holds its value. Everything else goes, I mean, I guess the commodity goes up too, mm-hmm. but the purchasing power, it holds its purchasing power. Exactly. Like, and that's the difference between that, between collecting dollars and collecting commodities mm-hmm. in general. Yeah. All a dollar is now is a piece of paper. Yeah. That's exactly. all it is. It can't be exchanged for anything of real value. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, I say that you obviously use them to buy things all the time. Those things have real value, but to it, me, to me, it's just the exchange though. Like I want, mm-hmm. I want my money in assets and mm-hmm. not sitting in a bank somewhere. Yeah. Right now. Absolutely. Like I just, I don't see, I mean, it makes no sense to have your money sitting in the bank somewhere. It's all mm-hmm. it's doing is losing value. Yeah. Something like two years ago, um, I moved a bunch of, a bunch of money, um, from like general stocks into a commodities, uh, like fund. fund. Yeah. 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 And, um, that commodities fund in the two or two and a half years or whatever is up like 25% or something. <laughs> I like bet that. it is. Yeah. Um, it's like, which really Best does, move, I mean, it was better than my gold well, investment in all, that time. All it did was protect its purchasing power, though, really. Yeah. I mean, if you think about what the inflation has been in the past two years, yeah. like that's really what you've protected. Well, it's, it's something that I've always tried to explain to people about gold. It's not that gold is more valuable. It's the dollar is less valuable. Exactly. And so it takes more dollars to buy the same amount of gold, but the gold has actually maintained its value yeah it's it's purchasing power is the same Mm -hmm. it's just the dollar amount for it has went up (laughs) right um so you know the short story is in the fed yeah (laughs) all right (laughs) and the the fed the federal reserve is such a crazy thing anyway (laughs) it just like you wonder how this was one of those things where the wool was just pulled over people's eyes yeah um, the federal reserve is essentially a, um, a government enforced monopoly given to a private entity on the money supply. <laughs> it's just the, I know you're right, but it just sounds so crazy when you put it in those terms. Yeah. But, but that's what it is. Like, <laughs> and at the time of it, that the legislation was drafted, the legislation was drafted by a bunch of highly competitive with each other mm-hmm. bank leaders. Yeah. Um, and they, but they agreed essentially to form this cartel that's now government sponsored. Yeah. It's, it's wild. To me. <laughs> yeah. Like, I mean, I I mean even... it's just like. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know what else to say about that. Like how crazy that is, and yeah. the government, the government passed it, and like I, I know, like I go back and forth talking about whether the Federal Reserve is a government entity or a private entity. Um, it's both is the problem. It, it is like the epitome of fascism. Yeah, because the the Federal Reserve was created by the government. It is uh, its director is appointed by the government, um, but. It has private investors that benefit from its actions. Yeah. <laughs> at the expense yeah. of all of the rest of us. Yeah. Yeah. At that. Um, and its purpose really was to limit competition. Yeah. And it's done that very well. Oh, well, yeah. If anything, it's done that. Yeah. It has not stabilized prices or maintained full employment, but it has been very good at eliminating competition yeah. in the banking system in the in the United States. So a question for you. Do you, like, as far as the employment thing goes, I don't know how much control they would have, but do you think that there's a way that it could be used to actually control the prices? I mean, I, to me, it just doesn't seem like that's feasible uh not directly but they do control fi- prices to some degree by um controlling the interest rates yeah not as effectively as they would like though i yeah. mean I, I i don't know th- i guess the answer is no in a simple sense of that it, they can't control prices through the things that they have control over yeah um it, it couldn't really be done because Prices are controlled by consumers. Yeah, through supply and demand. Mm-hmm. So I guess the consumers and the the producers, to a degree. Yeah. Um. It, it 
price is really created more by consumer demand than producer production okay. or supply. Yeah. Um, it, it's consumer demand that drives prices and the prices inform the producers where to what concentrate to... their resources. Gotcha. Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. That's, so. yeah, that's, I mean, there's some nuance there, but basically but speaking, that's, yeah, that, that's, that's yeah. in general terms. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, oh, that actually reminds me though of another thing about this government spending and its effect on consumer products is that it has become with the government providing 42% of the spending (laughs) in the United States. Um, it has become, uh, advantageous for businesses to cater to government demands rather than consumer demands. Okay. And so, um, resources that would have been devoted towards uh, creating products for average consumers, there's more of a guarantee revenue if you can instead um, turn those resources into production for something that the government will pay for. Oh, yeah, because there ain't nothing like that government money. Yeah. Government contracts are just more valuable. Oh, absolutely. Because they will always be paid. Yep. And if you're being paid by the government, you get to use the money before inflation catches up. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, and of course, the the Fed control of the interest rates creates a whole bunch of problems uh, upstream. Yeah. Um, because low interest rates are okay. So in a in a free market economy, yeah. where the interest rate was fixed by the market, yeah. Um, a low interest rate would indicate that uh that people aren't spending their saving. Yeah. Um and that that would be a uh a sign towards producers that they can they need to take the time now to invest in capital goods into yeah. increasing their ability to supply the demand the the future demand for products. Okay. All right. So, um, the, the problem with an artificially low interest rate is that the economy is being pulled in both directions because consumers are still consuming, but resources have been redirected by producers into future production instead of current production. Yeah. And so, uh, it creates shortages. (coughs) Yeah. Creates artificial scarcity. And it also, um, creates a situation where they're producing for a future demand that probably doesn't exist. Yeah. Because people aren't saving. Yeah. <laughs> they're they're still consuming. Absolutely. And so they don't have savings to for they don't have savings that they can use in the future to consume more. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, um, and this is a so and the I, I think what you're the dis- Austrian term is malinvestment. It creates uh, a lot of opportunities for malinvestment. I got you. Yeah. So, and, and under the situation, if I understand it correctly, so the government's not mandating the um, the interest rates. The market is. You would have different rates at different banks. Also true. Because the 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 bank's interest rate would be based on the amount of capital they have. Mm-hmm. And um, competition with uh, with other with local. local. Well, that too. Yeah. That would be a factor because mm-hmm. you'd want to be in in. Yeah, comparison. you want to be low enough that people want to go to you, but high enough that you can that still you're making money. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. Um, and it does. It also depends on their uh, their capital. Um, How much capital do they have on hand? Yes. Because under once again, we're talking about a non-fiat situation mm-hmm. where they actually can't loan out more than they have. Right. Um, and so the, the, the banks make money by loaning money. Yeah. But you can't loan money if you don't have money. Yeah. And well, so um, if you don't have enough money on hand to loan out, then you want to incentivize people storing their money with you. Yeah. By by increasing interest rates, exactly, um, so that you can then turn around and loan that money out for an even higher rate. I, yeah, exactly, yeah. exactly. So yeah, um, but that's not how it works. No, that it works right now. <laughs> nothing like that. Yeah, um, um, the 
but it would be it would it would be so much more beneficial for the people if that's how it actually worked like if we had that type of system mm -hmm. it would allow the economy to coordinate yeah um with the uh, with a whole bunch of intervention from the government through their own spending through control of interest rates through control of money supply through all these various um, ways that the the government intrudes on the economy well manipulates I mean what because that, that's what they're trying to, to do yeah. they're they're attempting to manipulate the economy yeah um, what it does is it it messes up all the signals between consumers and producers. Uh, in terms of the the desired goods that need to be produced, where resources need to be concentrated, where they need to be cut away, all of that stuff is completely messed up. And of course, you know, one of the big things about government spending is that government can never admit that they've made a bad investment. Yeah. So, another one of the problems, because they don't have to worry about profit and loss, and they can just create money out of thin air if they need to, is if they do make a bad investment, if they invest in a in a bad industry and that industry is failing, the answer isn't to cut their losses and get out. <laughs> the answer is to more put money more money in. in. Yeah, we got to put more in there. Uh, and, and just people should pay attention to that, like especially when you're just watching the news. Mm -hmm. like, And you can watch this happen in real time. Mm -hmm. Like something bad happens and the scream is, well, we got to put more money in it. Yeah. Like, I mean, you hear it all the time. You hear it with education. You hear it with infrastructure. You hear it with like, you just watch the news and, and pay attention to it with that in mind that, that everything that's a problem is a, just a ploy for more money from the government. Yeah. And the government printing of money, the creation of money out of thin air that drives it, uh, inflation. Yeah. Uh, inflation has a much bigger impact on our um, economy and society than people really understand, I think, in that. They're learning. Well, yeah. And, and <laughs> well, the higher the inflation is, the more apparent it becomes is yeah. that it drives out the middle class. Oh, yeah. It yeah. will turn the middle class, a few of them into wealthy people and most of them into poor, poor people. Oh, absolutely. Um, the, the high inflation rates eliminate middle class. Oh, yeah. Well, and, and right now the middle class is leveraged on credit. Mm -hmm. Like, I mean, you in, in, well, you know, low interest rates. Well, yeah, yeah, comparatively, but mm -hmm. like they're higher than they were. Yeah, it's it's easier to borrow right now. Yeah. Money's cheap. Yeah, well, a and lot of cheaper by the day in more good. ways than one. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Not in the good way. Yeah. <laughs> so, but yeah, like people are just like maxing out credit card just to survive. Mm -hmm. Like it's, well, I saw some numbers on, I don't remember them specifically, but like the amount of people that are just like living off credit cards right now is crazy. Yeah. Well, the I think the numbers that I keep seeing is the huge percentages of people that couldn't can't manage a thousand dollar unexpected yeah. yeah expense yeah and um and me personally I've had several of those over the last few months yeah yeah um, exactly <laughs> car issues medical issues etc. Well, and it's it's kind of a, a a weird cycle because if you're one of those people who can't afford like a thousand dollar emergency, mm -hmm. you tend to end up in those because like you don't drive as new of a car and you don't yeah. and you don't maintain it as well because mm -hmm. you're broke and like it's this like f feedback loop that it's it just sucks, man. Yeah. Like and it's I I don't know what the right answer is. I mean, the right answer is for the government to get out of the way ultimately, but. Oh. Um, I know what I'm about to say is going to make you like not have anything to say at all, but like yeah. keep talking for just, uh, just a moment while I go pull a book out of my bookshelves here. <laughs> all right. Um, and I can give some real numbers about how things have changed. Oh, I'll definitely be curious about that because things, like I say, it's, it's crazy, man. Like the people are just struggling right now. It's, it's a really hard, I don't know, man. And, and it, it's, the inflation, it's just crazy. Like people can't survive when everything's just going up, going up, going up. Oh, that's all I got. That, that was almost good enough. Almost. Um, <laughs> I'm now I can't find the page. Uh, so this is in Irwin Schiff's book called The Kingdom of Molts, which is essentially a comic. Um, yeah. I was gonna say it looks like a comic book. <laughs> it's it's essentially a comic. Yeah. Um, oh gosh, where is it? There's a, a bit at the end here though, where he compares purchase. Ah, here we are. All right. Um, 
where he, he compares purchasing power between 1970 and 1980. Okay. And I, I think there was an earlier one, too. Hang on. Oh, yes. So it's 1950, 1970, and 1980. Okay. And so in 1950, uh, an average home cost $12,000. Wow. In 1970, it was $36,000. In 1980, it was $75,000. Yeah. All right. Uh, Family car in 1950, $1,500. $3,200 in 1970, and $5,500 in 1980. Yeah. Um, let's see. Paycheck. <laughs> oh, here we go. <laughs> Paycheck in 1950. Uh, one person working in the household, $150. This is probably a week. Yeah. Um, in 1980, that paycheck is 200. <coughs> Wait, am I reading that right? Yeah. Um, is $250, but you got two people working in the house. Yeah. And in 1980, combined paychecks are $500. Yeah. Well, before taxes. Of oh, course. yeah. All right. Um, so, like the the rate at which the the actual goods increased in price was much higher than the rate of uh, wage increases. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the wages never keep up. Mm-hmm. And the the comparison there is when you talk about an actual commodity gold, silver, or whatever. Yeah. Like the same amount of gold would have bought that house all along. Yeah. Yeah. Dude, there's a commercial that is, I think it's a gold commercial, but they talk, but the example they use is if you had won like the grand prize on the prices, right. in like the seventies, um, what the total was you would have gotten in cash. Mm -hmm. And if you had put that money in a safe, and then took that amount of gold that you could buy at that time and put it in the safe. Yeah. What the difference between the two are. And it's just <laughs> astronomical. Oh, um, sure. I mean, you're talking, yeah, like 40 years or whatever, 50 years, but still like that's the, but it's something. So we just accept it. Like we just accept that over time, the money is going to be worth less and less. Mm-hmm. Like, cause it's been that way for all of our lives. Yeah. For pretty well, well for everybody. It, it's worse than that. Like we accept that the money is worth less and less. Yeah. Most people out there accept that things cost more and more, and it's those well, greedy capitalists that are the responsible That That is part of the problem, is that there's a lot of people don't understand the difference between the two. Mm-hmm. Um, that that there is there is that narrative out there that things are just more more expensive. And I try I correct people all the time. I'm yeah. like, no, no, your money is just worth less and less. Yeah. Like that's that's what's happening here. My um, um, my favorite bumper sticker at libertystickers.com hmm. is um, <laughs> things don't cost more than they used to. Your money's just worth less because the government keeps counterfeiting. Keeps counterfeiting. Oh, I love it. <laughs> <laughs> oh. So um, seems like a good enough place as any to end, don't you think? I think so. All right. You got anything um, more to say about that? No, no. I mean, it's just... Like I say, we got to change the way people think about this. Like that's the mm-hmm. first step. Like that's uh, that's what we're trying to do here today, and mm-hmm. like that's the goal. Like, yeah, we all benefit from a real independent free market. Yes, absolutely. Um, the more government interferes, the more it costs all of us. Yeah. And uh, if you if you really are worried about inequality and poverty and so forth. The answer isn't more government. It's a whole lot less. Yes, 100%. Um, it, it is those government privileges that allow people to accumulate wealth in, in a way that's so much greater than the people around them. Yeah. Um, it's, it's being politically connected that makes you one of the wealthiest elites in this country. It's not... It's not taking advantage of your workers. It's not taking advantage of the consumers. In fact, the consumers direct all this, except yeah. when government says you have to buy it. Yeah, exactly. Um, and uh, or government pays for it from with your money and without your consent. That's yeah. you know the other option, of course. Um, but the the truth is that the that capitalism in this country and and everywhere else around the world. Um, has reduced poverty and increased the uh, living standards of the average person everywhere that's been introduced. And one of my favorite things to ask people uh, that are on the more progressive or left side that 
have issues with capitalism and, and want more government intervention to rein in those capitalists, um, is I, I like to ask them, do you think that there's more poverty or less poverty in the world than there was 20 years ago? Yeah. And they will almost invariably say more. Yeah. And the truth is that actually there's significantly less. Yeah. Hundreds of millions of people worldwide have been pulled out of poverty because of liberalization of the markets. Not liberal in their sense, but liberalization is in freeing up freeing markets. Freeing the markets, yeah. Um, in India and China. Yeah. And, uh, you know, now in China, they're trying to rein that back in. So we'll yeah. see what happens. But we've been trying to rein it in here for a long time. But yeah. the truth is that lo lots of people were pulled out of poverty yeah. by Through free freer markets. markets. Absolutely. Um, and just, I always tell people, like, just think of what, what could this country be like if we just started pulling some of that stuff back? Mm -hmm. Like if we really had like the political will to just start reining that in, like we could have, I mean, it could just be, a, things could be so, so much better and heading in the right direction. Yeah. But, but that's not, that's not the direction we're heading though. Like the ship's going the wrong way. <laughs> the biggest creation of wealth in the history of the world was, um, between the, uh, War of 1812, the Second War of Independence, whatever you want to call it, yeah. um, and uh, the Civil War. Yeah. And then again, actually, between the Civil War and World War I. Yeah, yeah. Um, when we had mostly free markets. It was towards the end of the 19th century and early 20th century where the government started to step in a lot more on the markets. Yeah. But prior to and, that— And look what happened— through yeah. that. Like, I mean, you just like start going through history, mm -hmm. like post 1913, really. Yeah. And like, it's all downhill. Like there's all of this instability um, and that, and there's no consistency. Yeah. Um, and, and that's really the key. Is, well, you know what one of the, I think the most insidious myth ab about that time period is, yeah. at least to me, it seems, is the idea that, that entering World War II pulled us out of the Great Depression. Yeah, yeah. You hear that all the time. You do. There's no evidence for that whatsoever. In fact, it's it's all evidence to the contrary. Really? Um, there was really heavy rationing. Yeah. Um, of course, what one of the things that they talk about is full employment, but they took a third of the workforce in this country. <laughs> and moved them. <laughs> and conscripted them. Well, yeah, yeah. Forced them to go fight in the war. <laughs> yeah, like. and then had to fill in all that stuff with people that were still here. Yeah. Um, the yeah. the thing that really pulled us out of the Great Depression was the end of the war, yeah. when all those people came back here and joined rejoined the workforce, yeah, and created a production boom in this country like had never been seen before. Yeah, wow, yeah. Um, oh yeah. well, you, you, someone should write a book on that. I'm, <laughs> I'm pretty sure if you have, <laughs> yeah, I've probably read one somewhere along the way. Yeah. Um, talk to Tom Woods. Oh, yeah. <laughs> He's doing like one a month, right? Yeah. It right. feels like it. It does, doesn't it? Online books, ebooks. Yeah. All right. Now, this time for real, we're going to wrap right, it up. Let's close it up. Okay. So, um, we expect to be back here next week. We never talk about this until the end of the podcast, whether yeah. we have plans for next week or not. As far as I know, I'm clear, but you know what that, how that goes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, same for me. Um, we expect to be back here next week. In the meantime, you can follow us on Facebook. You can subscribe on iTunes, YouTube, Podbean. Like and share, comment, subscribe, uh, leave reviews. You can always email me at michael at thelibertymike.com if you know what that book is that talks about how um, the depression ended with the end of World War II, not with the beginning of it. Let me know because I, <laughs> I, 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 I love reading history stuff. <laughs> yeah. um, and then, uh, yeah, but we'll be back next week when we finally get this right. And in the meantime, try to stay free. Life short, live free. Ciao. Later. Mm -hmm.